my presentation is something I've been working on for a while. And I've, I've termed it, percep is perception really reality? Um, I've also called it perception is reality, <laughs> without the question mark. <coughs> because uh, when I started out my career with OSHA, I was listening to what workers were saying, what management was saying, and I was getting a completely different perception of compliance. You know, I was, I was identifying hazards, I was citing violations, and saying you must do this. Again, you must. But they're telling me this completely different message of what is really going on. That's what drove me to go to, motivated me to go to graduate school. So that's what I've been studying and practicing, and I'm continually learning. I don't have all the answers. I'll be the first to admit that. And my students would double that down. But I'm going to try and share a few things with you today. I, when I came to grad school, they started forcing me to think of the concept here on the bottom. What we don't know, we don't know. And that is, it's something you can basically sit and wrap your brain around on a beautiful fall day drinking coffee because it's, it's quite abstract, yet it really shakes the foundation of what we know or maybe what we don't know. And I have this cute little thing I found from Google Pictures of what you know, what you don't know, what you think you know, but as you can see, a majority is you're really not sure if you know it. And when I was in graduate school, uh, we'd be talking about safety in a class. I'd be like, oh, here's the answer. They're like, well, how do you know that? because the standard says that, but that's not the whole picture. And so then I, I had to almost relearn how to practice safety, citing or providing my reference or source or case to defend what I was saying. That was tough, because I really thought I knew what I was doing. I thought I was pretty awesome at safety. But then I went to grad school, I was like, whoa, it's a completely different world out there. And so what I want to challenge you all to do, and I'm going to do it for my entire presentation, is to give you different aspects, different looks at this basic concept of thinking about what we don't know, we don't know. Because if we presume to know, and we're incorrect, things are going to go wrong, and we're not going to know why. And then there's going to be anxiety and adversity, and we're not going to get along with each other. Over the summer, I tasked myself to Think of safety even in a new way. And it's not correct, I'm not going to re recommend you go out and read these books, but I was reading the works of, from the Enlightenment period. I was reading the philosopher David Hume, uh, his counterparts, John Locke, uh, Rene Descartes, which we're going to hear about later. And leading up to, uh, I think it's, uh, I was going to say John Adams, maybe it's not John Adams, I probably mess, messed that up. But, um, uh, I'll let that one go. But all these, all these guys who are really thinking about what is it to be human? What are we doing here? And I'm trying to think of it from the perspective of safety, that when I studied the history of safety, it was really born out of the Industrial Revolution. But if we focus only on safety, we're really missing the point. It's the work organization that was born out of the Industrial Revolution, and safety's part of that. And it's been sort of this ominous concept, this complex concept that we've kind of let, let be for a long time, but we've started to stir the paint, and I think that we're starting to realize there is more to the, there's more to the game than we originally thought, and both Rick and DJ are going to expand on that. So I want you all to, and I'm, gonna, I'm hoping this works, I want you all to kind of watch this and try to think about what's the hazard, what they do wrong. Stuff. Okay, so it stopped. Okay, so I want you to think yourself. When, when we're watching that, what sort of things come to mind? What do you think? What do you, when you see these people, what do you think as a safety professional? What should we do to prevent that from happening? What? Don't do it that way. Do it that way. Anybody come to mind? Are these guys insane? Is there? There may be a little bit off. Maybe we won't use the term insane, but they're a little bit off. It's not their job. Obviously. Not their job. But is there somewhat of a tendency to say, you know what, they should know better? Does everybody kind of agree they should know better? See, I'm trying to trick you, so yeah, that's what we're thinking. Well, there's something called the attribution error theory, or the theory of attribution error. And what it, what it basically, I'm going to really boil it down, and Dr. Moran is probably going to correct me on it, 
But basically, when we see someone get hurt, we automatically believe they knew full well that they should have applied common sense, and they must have made a decision to hurt themselves because of the way they did it. And see, do you see how you watch that video? Like, that person knew they, they, they probably tried to do that, and they should have known better. But when we're the ones who get hurt, when we're the ones in the accident, we can usually identify multiple external factors. So attribution error is basically we assume all internal as the fault, but when we're the one who gets hurt, we can usually identify external factors. So who's right? Well, we want to think that people don't want to get hurt. I mean, they didn't do it on purpose. They made some tough decisions which resulted in injury. And we should be able to understand or really investigate, consider, postulate what were they thinking? What went into the selection? I mean, obviously they put they had a chair on stack, or they had a ladder on stacked chairs. Maybe they didn't have the right ladder. Why didn't they have the right ladder? You know, why didn't they have maybe a cherry picker or um, an articulating scaffold or something like that that would allow them to do it without using that setup? And so that's something we need to think about. Let's not blame, but let's figure out what might have gone into that decision. So here is an example of the corrective factor if we control attribution error. Accident? This was no accident. The company should have replaced that ladder years ago. I knew I shouldn't have reached over like that. And why isn't there a strict policy about two people doing a job like this? So in 2007, this Canadian group created a series of commercials like this to really get you know, the public to realize when someone gets hurt, they didn't intend to get hurt, they're just trying to do their job and kind of pointing to the external factors. There's a whole series of these, by the way. You can find them on YouTube. Um, some of them are a little bit more gruesome than that one. I, I took kind of the tame one. <laughs> you guys are like, really? Yeah, that was the tame one. But doesn't it kind of bring home the point? You know, We see something, we automatically assume what happened. But then they kind of give us an insight to, well, why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that? And in, I think safety needs to make that leap. Instead of reactionary things and blame, we need to think ahead from more of a systems perspective. So what we see is not always what's there. And I've got this cute little video that demonstrates how our brains can be easily tricked and we desire to find trends. We desire to understand and sometimes our brain is tricked in trying to accomplish that task. Oh, that's really loud. The pink straw on the left looks much smaller than the one on the right. In reality, they're exactly the same size. Take a look at this drawing and see if you can count the number of grey dots. As you try to focus on the grey dots, they'll vanish right in front of your eyes. Ask someone to put their hands together and then extend their two first fingers. Have them keep their first fingers around about an inch apart. Now gently circle around their fingers, asking them to imagine a loop of thread becoming tighter and tighter. Amazingly, their fingers will drift together. The lines in this grid are parallel to one another. However, if you move some of the rows to the side, the lines suddenly seem to slant up and down. In reality, they're still exactly parallel. The red shape and the black shape look completely different. They're exactly the same size. Ask someone to hold their hand against yours, and then, using the thumb and first finger of their other hand, to stroke the two first fingers. They will feel as if their first finger is completely numb. Take a look at this drawing. It appears to be a rabbit looking to your right, or a duck looking to the left. It will keep flipping between the rabbit and the duck as your brain tries to figure out what's going on. Take a look at the two squares that the black arrowheads are pointing to. The top square looks much darker than the lower one. This illusion is created by the areas surrounding each square. This is simply a piece of paper with two holes cut out, but it allows us to mask off the surroundings. And suddenly you can see that the squares are indeed identical. The piece of paper marked A looks much bigger than the piece of paper marked B. However, put B below A and now B looks larger. Amazingly, in reality, they're exactly the same size. Now stare at the centre of the spiral. Don't take
take your eyes off the centre of the spiral. Keep on staring at the spiral. Keep staring at the centre of the spiral. And now look at the back of your hand. Did you, you still see motion? That's what it is. So the point I'm trying to make is that what we see, what we think we're observing, is not always what it seems to be. And that bring, goes back to that same initial concept of what we don't know, we don't know. We think we know, we think we understand, but those assumptions and our brain attempting to you know, conceive of what the real world is, is an issue. And I mean, that's, that's what David Hume was getting into and that's what I've been reading over the summer. Um, in, from a research perspective, we're always trying to find what, how maybe something may cause something else, how A may cause B, or how A may be related to B. And I believe in safety, at least of what I've observed and what I've read, sometimes we oversimplify a complex problem. And when we do that, we are assuming, oh, this will always cause this, because we always try to control A. When in fact, even though A and B may have a relationship, it goes through a lot of other things. So someone gets hurt, we blame them, we train them, we punish them. But was that really the issue? Well, if we only, if we are mindset that unsafe acts, unsafe conditions cause all problems, you know, AKA Heinrich, Heinrich's work, um, we may not, it may work sometimes, but not all the time. And I think that the, the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics indicates sort of a plateau right now that we've been going through for the last three or four years. And I believe that we've kind of reached our limit on traditional safety approaches. And I think we need to kind of reevaluate or go through almost an enlightenment period in order to better understand what we can do to improve worker safety. And I believe it comes from a systems perspective, uh, focusing on communication and relationships. And instead of just focusing on safety, focusing on getting people to be successful and happy, but and encouraging safety at the same time. So what I'm proposing is this system. Rick is going to talk about systems as well. This was the systems approach that I was taught in grad school and used in a lot of my research. It's based on a paper called The Balanced Theory of Job Design by Mike Smith and Pascal Carrion. And what's interesting to me, now Heinrich gave us the domino theory. It was a unilateral system, but an extremely simplistic system. This is more dynamic and complex in that these five elements are consistently influencing each other and interacting. And whenever there is an imbalance in this system that puts too much stress and strain on the worker and they are unable to identify or react or make a decision that would allow them to protect themselves, they'll be exposed to a hazard or risk which may or may not result in injury. And so when injuries occur, if we just focus on the worker and the, the proximal environment for that, we may miss all these other influences. And it may just not be one simple influence. It might be. Sometimes it is simple. But I think we've kind of controlled those simple things pretty well. I think we've kind of put those to bed. I think what we need to do is expand our perspective, expand our reality to take in more information, to understand bigger things. Dwight D. Eisenhower was quoted with saying, whenever I couldn't solve a problem, I would make it larger. I would enlarge it and look, for, look at it from a bigger perspective, and then you could find what actually the solutions might be. Reformatting or reassembling the work system, and this is something I teach in my classes, we've got the, the four elements here. Organization, which basically is mostly management and policy, culture, climate. Uh, we've got the environment, the task in which the, it's designed. The environment is the physical and social environment. Technology are the tools they use, the equipment they use, machinery. These things are all interacting in order to accomplish a particular task, a particular goal. Now when there's an imbalance there or an incongruency with safety, so there's work and safety, it's, it's put upon the person to mitigate that. And they may do it through behavior, they may do it through personal protective equipment, um, there are a number of things they can possibly do, but they're not 100%, and, and Dr. Moran is going to talk about that, that there are going to be slips, lapses, and Rick is going to talk about this, which allows a person not to be able to withstand those discrepancies, which then while they do their job, three things can happen. There can be no exposure, which they won't get hurt, and exposure and no injury, which we know that happens, and then exposures and injuries, which then it gets recorded and investigated. Unfortunately, if our investigation just sticks to the person 
or the behavior of the person, we're really missing the interaction of those other four elements. They actually influence perception, influence attitude, influence behavior. And so when somebody go, oh, behavior is a predictor of bad safety or, or good safety, you know, so you know, measuring behavior, behavior to me is a lagging indicator. It's the result of many other things. But if we observe it, we need to actually then search back to find out what would lead. So what's, what was the, what's, what's the general consensus of why to do it this way? What's the supervisor's thought on it? What's the top management's thought on it? And I've actually done studies like this where I've compared the perception of different levels within an organization and looked for discrepancies in their, in their perception. And the greater the perception between what they think the job is supposed to be, the more likelihood for injury. That's what I found in my research. I did publish it, but it was in a conference proceedings that I bet you nobody's ever heard of or seen, except for like Dr. Choi and Dr. Tavera. That's about it. So I'm trying to promote that focusing on just the person or the proximal environment of the person who was injured is an example of what we don't know we don't know. That we should look beyond it. That the reason somebody did get exposed was because they believed management wanted them to do it that way and they were just trying to get the job done. And I've actually done other interviews and research in different states which support that contention. I'm going to spend the rest of the time sharing my own philosophy on safety, the principles I apply. And I think that these principles allow us to try and mitigate these influences of I perceive, I think I know. Okay? Here they are, but I'm going to go through each one individually. But first, I just want to look, t look at the data very quickly. The problem with data is it can, be, it can be misrepresented, it can be misinterpreted. And we, we, look at, we, we look and we know what the primary causes of injury and death are in the workplace. Uh, we know which industries tend to have greater or lesser rates. But that's so generalized. I really think safety needs to be understood from the worker, the supervisor, the work they're doing. And unfortunately, we don't collect it down to that detail. And so this is interesting, but doesn't really give us much. This quote down here from Albert Einstein I think is very important. If you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And we do that for a lot, we do that to a lot of workers. We really do. Because I, I mean, I think our role and what I try to teach my students to do is if we're going to practice safety, first we, we have to understand the work first. That's primary. They're there to do a job. And we go up to a worker and we start talking to them. And as students, it might be a little bit easier because they're like curious, you know, could you show me what you do? Or if they're wearing like a sports hat or a hunting or fishing thing, you can ask about that. But as soon as they trust you, which is key, they'll start telling you stories. And those stories will give us so much more information, data, understanding of what's really going on versus what we observe or the checklist that we're filling out. So be careful with this data. This figure, and we can argue what it really says, encapsulates my reason for going to graduate school. That um, in a one week span when I was a compliance officer, I went to a small machine shop in the middle of nowhere. It was essentially a guy's garage. It was a big garage. And they had no safety program. The owner was the safety director, was the HR director, was the maintenance director. You get the, the gist. And as a compliance officer, okay, so the programs were violations. And I went out and there were hazards. It was dark, dank, smelled. And I was worried. So then he's showing me around, and I have to go interview workers. That's part of the role. But when I interviewed the workers, it, it, the, the manager would introduce me to the person by first name. But then I noticed he would ask a personal question. How was your kid's baseball game last night? How was boating over the weekend? You know, how did the tournament go? Each one, he knew something you know, intimate. The, he, these were friends of his, not workers. They were friends. And so when I talk to the workers, you know, I'm standing there with their machine. It was like a drill press. I'm like, you know, this isn't guarded, this isn't here. Yeah, I know. You know, I'm able to do my work and I don't put my hand in the way. There's no reason I would do that. And if I need help, I know the boss has got my back. So I finished that inspection and I tried to, they call them grouping, of thing, of, to lower the penalties. And I was trying to help the guy because at the end I go, well, you know, how many injuries have you had here? None. Oh, we've never had anybody hurt. So basically, the, you know, the, the, the case the, the, of, of what not to do from an OSHA perspective, no injuries, my brain like short-circuited. I'm like, what? So go back to the office. I'm writing it up, and I had to go out on another inspection. It was a complaint inspection with a major Fortune 100 company. So I went there. 
The safety directors, well known, published, you should see their wall of safety programs. I mean, I think when I looked at it, I heard, oh, and it was like glowing, I swear. <laughs> and so then I'm like, okay, I'm hearing this complaint, and the guy's super nice. He showed me, everything's in order. Okay, let's go look at what's going on. We go to the site where the complaint is, and it's clean. <laughs> There's nothing going on. But I said, you know, for my report, I gotta go talk to a worker. I go to the workers, and they lit up. This place is the worst. They're hiding stuff. They do this to us. You know, this person got hurt the other day. And I'm like, but I'm not seeing anything, so I can't cite anything, but I took a note. And it was that Friday that I just had experienced those two things. I'm like, what is going on in the world? I, I, I was, I've been taught, trained. I thought I knew. My understanding was OSHA compliant, no injuries. Not OSHA compliant, injuries like crazy. But then there was this, this experience, and that actually drove me to go to graduate school to study human factors, organizational design, social inquiry. And that's why I'm here in front of you. So I'm going to share with you now. And as you can see here, this kind of supported, I'm sorry I'm messing up your picture. Um, smaller companies who had really don't have resources to do safety, they probably don't have a safety person, they probably have someone from their work comp carrier send in a loss control person every once in a while. They've got the lowest. Now, you probably think to yourself, but OSHA says 10 or less, you don't have to keep an OSHA log. Yes, I understand that. But for the data they have, for what they have, it seems lower. And then it goes up as you get a little bit larger. So to me, what I interpret from that is there's more of a social influence on safety than there is the compliance part. And that's why I study it and teach it the way I do. So let's go quickly through my, I've got about 15 minutes left, um, my principles. I believe safety is an attribute of work. We should not study it outside of the realm or out of the entity of work itself. And that means the work organization, the work system itself. Because it's in competition. If, let me give you an example. Um, I went to the dentist once. They were cleaning my teeth. She goes, do you floss? I'm like, no, not that much. So she proceeded to put the floss on my mouth, jumped off her chair, and did this. So I'm bleeding, and I'm like, okay, that was the wrong thing to say. So the, the, the correct answer is, do you floss? Yes, I floss every day. <coughs> if you go up to a worker you know, and say, okay, what are you doing for safety? It's going to become the most important thing for that short period of time. Anybody ever go on a visual inspection and the workers see you coming and they throw on their PPE? Because they believe it's the right thing to do when asked. So what we need to do is study the work itself and see how safety really competes with these other things. And that's where my research when I was in graduate school, I was out interviewing caregivers and their supervisors and management. And I didn't bring up safety. I was asking questions about the work, the procession of work, the relationships they have, what they perceive as commitment. Safety never came up by itself. We had to initiate it at the end of the interview to find out what they thought about it. And at that point, it had really shown its true colors. That it's the organization that can promote it as being there or not being there. And at this place, it had been removed, the data supported it. By a change in mindset, a few change in the way we, they did the tasks, things got better very quickly. It was more of a social correction and some job design correction that let safety be part of the job versus competing with it. So this is a, a big issue I have, and I, it goes into different areas, but I'm gonna not go into it at this point. I believe workers wanna do a good job, and that came out of my work at the, uh, when I was working at the state, that when I was interviewing workers, they were really committed to their job. They knew what they needed to get done, and they took pride in what they did, but they really didn't like management, and they didn't like who they were working for. Seems weird, doesn't it? Workers want to do a good job. As safety professionals, we need to keep that in mind at all times. We, we do need to do, we need, there are certain things we need to do. Sometimes we can't control a hazard or a risk and we've got to use PPE or administrative controls, whatever it might be. I understand that. But we should always keep in mind the worker wants to do a good job. And if we're inhibiting that, we're giving them a decision to be safe or to get the job done. And what do you think they choose? They typically choose to get the job done. Unless we're standing there, then they'll, they'll choose the, the, the former. So we have to keep that in mind. We need the workers to be successful. I don't believe workers want to get hurt. Yet why do we assume we see them to get hurt that they did it on purpose, that they did something, that they're not smart, that they did it, you know, they knew better and they violated it on purpose. Well, that's attribution error right there. I've got some pretty cool pictures if you can see it. <laughs> there are plenty of them out there. I could probably put up videos too. <coughs> When a worker is trying to do a good job and we don't integrate safety into the work and they get hurt and then we blame them, they experience something called 
basically we violate something called equity theory. Equity, yeah, equity theory, which is also called organizational justice. They want to be treated fairly, but we've now blamed them. And what happens is, when you've been treated unfairly, unequitably, when something you perceive is not fair, something happens with you. You, you. you get negative towards it, the relationship is affected, your behavior changes, or sometimes you completely leave the environment. So when I go to places and they go, oh, we got high turnover here, are you treating people unfair? That's probably it. And I know that there are some, and I don't know if my colleagues are going to do it, say that, oh, if we improve safety, we're going to improve satisfaction. Baloney. If you improve the job, you improve the relationships, you can improve satisfaction. And then safety can come along with it. I don't believe safety is the, you know, the, the beacon that we follow. I believe it's something we do more on the tail end or earn through um, hard work and iterative improvements. So equity theory, I believe it predicts a lot of behavior. Um, let me give you an example. Anybody here ever kind of get cut off while you're driving? And you feel you've been treated unfairly? What do you do? You don't have to say it out loud. You don't have to show me your middle finger. But that feeling you have of trying to teach that person a lesson or to correct them what they did to you, even though they didn't do it on purpose, there's equity theory. Let's go, to, you know, go into the workplace. Anybody ever be in a, in a job and you're working your tail off and this person next to you is not and you get the same promotion or you don't get recognized for that extra work? That affects you. It does. Um, and we can even take this to a, like a negative side. Some of these shootings that happen in which these shooters produce a manifesto, it's basically they just talk about how unfair things were to them. And they were trying to correct that unfairness, that inequity they believed in their life. And we're constantly looking for fairness. And I think it allows people to justify being angry. It makes them justify leaving. It makes them justify doing bad things. And so we need to talk to people and have them understand. Because inequity is a perception. It is. It's a perception of what's going on out there versus what's going on in the head. And the only way to really correct it is through socialization and talking. Organizations are only, are, are only successful as the success of its individuals. We need every worker to be successful in their job, be safe as well. Um, and if anybody is slacking off and not holding up, somebody has to pick up those reins. Somebody has to make up for it. And if somebody's making up for it and not being recognized for it, they're going to feel inequitable. It's going to be negative things. So we should both improve the work so people can be successful and safe, but everybody should have the same opportunity or strive to be successful in their work and also feel cared for and also, you know, feel pride in what they get done. That's going to cause more commitment to the workplace. It's going to allow them to be more, to communicate better, have better relationships. You know, a team, do I have the team up here? A team who communicates, understands each other, understands their role and appreciates what they're delivering are going to perform better than five individuals or ten individuals or a hundred individuals doing their own thing. It's true. Organizations are as unique as individuals and what I mean by that is that you should not buy a safety program. You need to build it. It's through struggle and failure and learning your lessons that you develop something that's customized to your organization. I truly believe that. Uh, I, I've been on inspections where <laughs> I sit down, you know, when I was a compliance officer, could, could I see your HASCOM program? The safety director proudly pulls this binder off the shelf, takes off the plastic in which he purchased it and set it in front of me. I'm like, oh, this isn't a program. I don't know what you're thinking. Even though the program is more out in the work environment. We need to build it. We need to go through it. And I've been thinking a lot about this basic concept, not just in safety, but, you know, pursuing professional certifications, pursuing advanced degrees. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on LinkedIn right now where people are like, oh, you know, PhDs don't know anything. I've met a bunch of dummies, and, but I've, I know this person who doesn't even have a high school diploma, and they're really good at safety. That's cool, but what you have to go through to earn something is what makes you what you are. What you go through to build your safety program is what makes it real. So if you try to purchase it or just put it in place, some people can buy degrees. There are diploma mills out there, and it's not worth it because they didn't go through the process to get it. They didn't go through the work. You know, studying for an exam, what you go through to study for the exam is what makes you a professional. Um, and that's something I measure in my classrooms, is that I want to see the work itself, the, the effort, the commitment, the failure and, and, and corrective and fixing it is what makes you earn that degree and makes you a good safety professional versus kind of flying by, getting a grade and getting through. I think you got to work for it. Everybody has to work for it. It's what you earn. It's not the destination, it's the journey for me. Uh-oh, there we go. But 
all in all, companies do need to make a profit, and I know that that's always been a complaint with safety professionals, that the most difficult thing we do is try to get management to invest. And I think there's more and more literature out now that gives us the tools and techniques we need to do a cost-benefit analysis on safety. I come from an engineering background. I had to do cost justification for tweaking a process to you know, get better productivity or something like that. Um, I think we can do the same thing with safety. I don't think the data is as readily, readily available as it should be. We've got some estimations out there. But I think with a little bit of due diligence and being a little bit conservative on what we're talking about and taking a systems approach, so we're actually fixing it versus you know, dumping $100,000 into a fix that doesn't isn't actually improve anything, I think we can actually show a company we can reduce the operating costs in order to then improve their profits. I was going to go over the stuff that's behind here, but my message is boiled down to um, you can basically today change your thinking on how you practice just by considering what you don't know you don't know. Just stop and question. You know, did I really, is that really what just happened? When those people you read are in accident report, is that really what happened or do I have to dig a little bit deeper? I did it at the state when I was in grad school. We fundamentally changed the way we do record keeping and I trained all the supervisors on this basic methodology and the reports came in with you know, more data, more enriched experiences, and I was able to then analyze that and better pinpoint where the issues really were. That led to the interview studies and more in-depth work studies in which I was improving safety, but by improving the job, letting people be more successful, and that's what I did. And so that's what I'm trying to teach now. This looks like a very, very simple, it's the last slide, it's a very simple explanation of why things can go good or bad or why things can go well. I believe management, does this thing work? I believe management makes decisions based on what they see and what they read, mostly what they see. And then they set up policies, goals, and expectations based on those. That needs to somehow trickle down through the organization, typically through the supervisor, be communicated to the workers. What is the expectation? If safety is completely removed from that, that's confusing, that's stressful, and they gotta choose. So they just try to do what they're trying to do, trying to do a good job, want to be treated fairly, and though, then there are outcomes. There may be injuries, there may be failures, whatever it might be, but management needs to keep the ship you know, straight ahead. So then they change things. Uh, okay, now if someone gets hurt, they need to come in front of the, the board of directors and explain why they got hurt and what they're going to do differently to prevent themselves from getting hurt again. No, that actually happened. That's a quote. Okay, so we're blaming the worker for trying to do a good job. Now they feel they've been treated inequitably, and now they're gonna completely change the behavior. And you wouldn't believe the numbers I was looking at from an injury perspective, from an absenteeism perspective, from a work comp perspective, because of this attitude. It was the wrong way to go. As safety professionals, what we have the ability to do is to come down here and talk to them. What, you know, what, what do you expect out of your work? Are you able to gain any satisfaction from it? Are you getting along with your coworkers? Are you getting along with your supervisor? You guys all on the same page? Probably not. And then we take that information and the data we collect to management to give them a more realistic perception. Again, they're not thinking about what I don't know, I don't know. They're, this is what I observed, this is what we need, let's get there. So we give them more of a realistic picture of what's going on and have the rules and communication and support to try and reach these new goals or this new pathway. Workers see that and they react to it. And so this can be either a cycle of things getting bad or things getting good, depending on where, what we give management. So I think that's where we really have our advantage. I mean, I'm talking kind of like a little bit theoretically, but a little bit, <laughs> it's completely. I've, I've been able to change things just by persuading management of what's really going on. And I've met consultants that that's all they really do. It's more of a, this is, what's real, this is what you think's going on and how you're reacting, but this is what's really going on and this is how you should react. And then things can get better, not just from a compliance, but from a social. Once the social gets better and the work is more successful, safety will get better because we're doing the right things. That is all I have. Are there any immediate questions or are you guys ready for a break? All right, we'll take a 10 minute break and then I'll get Rick started. Thank you. <laughs>